Hi, welcome again to Talking Sunday Readings. My name is Ann Carter. I am here again with Pastor Richard Stadler and once again with Father Chuck Carter. And we are going to talk about the readings for the second Sunday after Easter. Um, they are, the uh, first lesson is from the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. The um, epistle lesson is from 1 John 1, 1 through 2, 2. And the gospel is from the gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Uh, this first part in Acts talks about the, the, the new church, how they first responded to the resurrection, um, and how they all lived together, how they continued the common purse that Jesus had had them use when they were all together, hmm. that they had all things in common, that they, they took care of the needy, that they took care of each other. Um, now, there's a fellow in England. His name is Brian Capper. He um, is, does research at Canterbury Christ Church University. He studies the Dead Sea Scrolls. He studies poverty in, ancient, in the ancient world. And as he says, he's, he does, he's studying the Christian way of dealing with poverty, and in particular this section of Acts 4, that they, had, that they gave to each other so much of what they were. And he says the Essenes did the same thing that they had monasteries throughout Israel, and that there was a collection of Essenes in Jerusalem, and that they practiced this giving of themselves to the needy in ancient Jerusalem, hmm. and that the Christian church picked it up and carried it forward throughout time, hmm. starting hospitals and starting um, soup kitchens, etc. That it is, a, it is a very Christian thing to look out for each other, and it was started by Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think... There's nothing in the text that indicates they were taking care of the other poor people that weren't Christians. Mm -hmm. And so that concern for benevolence to outsiders is something that does grow in the, in the Christian mm -hmm. church. But here, the text is very specific. They were taking care of each other mm -hmm. and fellow believers, which is why there are historians that record the observation of all Christians in the first centuries my, how they loved one another, mm -hmm. which was uncharacteristic, apparently, in their world. Mm -hmm. And so here we see it you know, really emblazoned. Mm -hmm. you know. I imagine had it been otherwise, that is, had, had they not been of one heart and one soul, as the, the text says, I don't think the church would have survived, especially no. that early period in, of persecution. Well, and I think this whole book that this is found in is a misnomer. It's not the acts of the apostles. It's not the acts of the disciples. It's the acts of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, through his church. Mm. Mm. And, and I think you, all three verse of, uh, readings are connected with that thought. The resurrected Christ is alive. And here's how he shows himself. He shows himself here by motivating and energizing his people to take care of each other, to take, make sure that they, um, no one is in need. And you'll see the same kind of emphasis that Jesus is alive and animating the faith of his disciples. And in the gospel, he comes to people who have doubts and misgivings, and he is alive to minister to them and to do something about their doubts, not just say, ain't it awful, you know? So um, that's a wonderful reminder here in the Acts that they were not self-centered. They weren't just concerned about doing their own thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they were concerned about each other. Mm -hmm. And I would say, too, that it's a voluntary sacrifice of their own goods, which I think is an imitation of Christ's own self-giving, you know? Right. Um, that it is taking to heart literally the pattern set forth by, by Christ. Um, they do it for each other. And by being voluntary, it's in a contrast to communism. Some people have mm -hmm. tried to say the early church was communistic. Mm -hmm. It was not. Mm -hmm. You don't have a governing authority saying from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Uh, this is something they did voluntarily. And when Ananias and Sapphira lie about it, it's obviously they're not doing it in the same spirit mm -hmm. as Joseph here does, who's identified as Barnabas. Uh, mm -hmm. who is a Levite, and so he could have excused himself by saying, um, I have Levitical mm -hmm. heritage, um, I must take care of myself, and so forth, but um, he doesn't. He sells his property and he shares it with the people that are in need. Uh, mm -hmm. 
He's a, a interesting character. Um, I had forgotten that Barnabas had a birth name of Joseph, and when you look through the book of Acts, he's with Paul, he goes out and searches for Paul. He's one of the trusted ambassadors to work between the Jerusalem church and the church in Antioch when they're having all these problems with Judaizers saying, no, you gotta follow the Jewish law in order to be a real Christian. And he and Paul are the official ambassadors back and forth. And then finally you get to Acts 14 and he's identified as an apostle together with the apostle Paul. So he, and he goes on the first missionary journey with Paul mm -hmm. and John Mark. And when um, John Mark bails out on them, when it comes time for a second missionary journey, he wants to take John Mark along. And we find out from the letter in Colossians that it's because he's his cousin that John Mark and mm -hmm. Barnabas were cousins. And, and Paul says, absolutely not. And it creates such a division between them that they go separate ways. Mm -hmm. And yet that paroxysm in the Christian mission home uh, actually multiplies the number of people who can be reached. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's kind of a, yeah. a interesting dynamic yeah. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is an interesting dynamic when we consider how many families there were that were involved as the early believers. Mm -hmm. That it, it was Jesus' brothers and it was, it was the, so many brothers were, were apostles. And yeah. then to look at the extended families of yeah. uh, that there was there had to be a lot of trust, mutuality of interest, and then mutuality of concern for mm -hmm. each other. Yeah. Well, then, if you turn mm -hmm. to the epistle lesson, First John chapter one, verse one, um, how would you connect this with uh, what we've just been talking about? Well, I think in, in verse three, here we have uh, he writes that. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Um, I see kind of that same sort of voluntary giving away. We want you to enjoy what we have. So come on and, and join the party with us. Join this fellowship that we have enjoyed with God the Father um, through his Son, Jesus Christ, that you too can share in that as well. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation in to enjoy this good, this good thing that we are experiencing. Um, and we want, it's freely, we're freely offering it to you as well. It's sort of an evangelistic invitation, I think. And he invites them into this certainty that they can have the courage to say, I'm a sinner, but I know I can be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Because that's what he builds on for the whole end of chapter one. And then he gets mm -hmm. into chapter two and he reminds them that if you do sin, he, God doesn't want you to sin, but if you do sin, you've got an advocate with the Father. Mm -hmm. And that's what is at the very center of this fellowship that Christ creates among his believers, mm -hmm. is that people are all of one co conviction. Yes, I can be forgiven. And that's what gives me the courage to fess up and come clean and, mm -hmm. and be honest about myself. You know, and when I look in the mirror, instead of seeing a saint, I have to say I'm seeing a sinner saint. You know, mm -hmm. uh, there's something defective, but I also realize that I'm loved. And, and if you are in a fellowship of those who are in fellowship with Christ and the Father, then they will forgive you as well. Exactly. And, and that forgiveness, that life, that experience extends out. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think this fits in the Easter season, because if um, one unifying thought is that the resurrected Christ is now alive in his church, then he's animating people to practice his love. Like he says, love one another as I have loved you. And the love of Jesus is not conditional. It's unconditional. Mm -hmm. It's on the basis of grace. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we human beings have our limitations because of our sinful natures. And sometimes it's not so easy to love certain people who have especially done you wrong or hurt you. And we don't even pray for their conversion. We just are angry at them or feeling hurt. Mm -hmm. And is, we need that reminder that we get in this section of scripture that let us walk in the light and let us keep celebrating what Christ is bringing us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how does that lead to the gospel lesson? Let me suggest one possibility. And that is that if Christ is alive in his church, he's alive in his church right away on the day of Easter, the mm -hmm. day of his resurrection. And if he has now re-entered his exalted state, and he's laid aside his humiliated state, 
which limit, uh, by which he did not show all of his divine qualities all the time. He now is fully God. Even though he's got a human body, he's still fully God. Whether he's visible or invisible, he is still fully God. That helped me understand how he could get inside that room. The point is he was there because God is omnipresent. Mm -hmm. So he was already there invisibly when they were having all their discussions. Mm -hmm. And he was there when Thomas explained he wouldn't believe unless he got to do the same thing that everybody else got to do because the text is very clear that Jesus showed his hands and his side to the disciples and that may mean that he also allowed them to touch it and, mm -hmm. and see that he was alive and that he was real. Um, and all Thomas is doing is asking for equal rights and equal opportunity. And uh, Jesus hears all that. Mm -hmm. And so when he appears the next week to Thomas, he doesn't have to say, Thomas, got any questions? He knows what he knows. questions he has, and he addresses them. And I believe that's why he instantly says, my Lord and my God. Yeah. He realizes that only if Jesus is God could he have heard everything he said and match his question so specifically. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's kind of neat. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It is. Um, I saw First John 1.1. 1, 1. We declare to you it was from the beginning what we have heard, what we have seen, what we have looked at and touched. And then in the gospel, the the, the disciples saw him, they heard him, they touched him, and then they were able to go out and declare mm -hmm. what they knew mm -hmm. to be real. It wasn't, uh, they didn't hear somebody else tell the story and decide that they were going to believe it and just pass it on. Mm -hmm. It was, a, it was a tactile, if that's the right word. Yeah, tactile, tangible. Tangible. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. it, was, it was totally real. Yeah. Because... Mm -hmm. They saw it right in front of them. They feel Undeniable. it. Undeniable. That's it. And you see the consequences in their lives. They were transformed by this reality of his resurrection. Mm -hmm. If they had all gotten together and conspired to make up this story about the resurrection of Jesus, it would not have empowered them the way the reality empowered them mm -hmm. to suffer all for Christ because mm -hmm. they knew that he was stronger than death. Mm -hmm. And so that's what made them willing to go to the to death themselves as martyrs. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it was a transforming thing that Jesus did for them. Mm -hmm. um, and my favorite line, my favorite verse, I think, is blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Mm -hmm. That all of us now who have not had, the, had that tactile, visual, hearing, all of our senses employed with Jesus are blessed and can be transformed and, empow and empowered mm -hmm. the same way that they were. Blessed are us who have not seen and yet have believed. That's a great reminder. And it also dismantles this false alternative that sometimes people offer when they quote that verse, that people who see and need to see and believe are somehow defective believers, but those who believe without seeing, they are the blessed. And th he's not saying that in this text. He never says that. Uh, the b disciples were blessed because they got to touch him and so forth. You and I are blessed because the Holy Spirit has brought us to faith even though we haven't touched him. You know, uh, He's touched us through his word. And that word is the creative power you know, for faith and for discipleship, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I noticed here was um, the greeting of Jesus. Um, Peace be with you. Yeah. yeah. He could have been holding out a finger mm -hmm. and saying, you guys, what a bunch of disappointments. I send the ladies and you won't believe them. I told you for three or four times I was going to rise from the dead and you didn't believe me. How sh uh, he could have shamed them yes, and, he and he could have scolded them. But his first words are gospel, mm -hmm. shalom. Mm -hmm. Peace be with you. Yeah. And so when Paul says grace and peace, I just ran across this recently. Um, he may have been using both Greek and Hebrew. And almost all of his letters start with grace and peace to you and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Grace is Greek. Peace. Peace is shalom. And he may have said it to a mixed audience, maybe even writing it in Hebrew and in Greek, in order to appeal to both the Jewish believers that were getting his letters mm. and also the Gentile readers. Uh, I never thought about that yeah. until I ran across that thought. And yeah. I thought, that's worthwhile yeah. uh, to maybe think about here, that Jesus is coming and saying to his disciples, um, I still love you. you know? 
and he'll say the same thing to Peter up mm-hmm. on the Sea of Galilee yeah. when he asks him to He's feed the, his sheep. He is the victim of persecution, of our, um, of our suffered for our sakes, you know, died because of our, um, of our transgressions, you know, the song of the suffering servant in Isaiah. And yet he comes back with forgiveness. Mm-hmm. He doesn't come back with vengeance. Right. He comes back with forgiveness, with healing, right. with, um, with empowerment. Yeah. And I think, um, if anything, that, that again, uh, some of these themes over the last few Sundays have been, what is the glory of God? And I think this uh, puts a nice capstone on, on a demonstration of what God's glory truly is. That's right. His mm-hmm. grace and his forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And when people receive that, that glorifies God. Yeah. yeah. Some great readings. Mm-hmm.